Welcome to Dominion Life Denver Training Center. Yay! So glad to see all of you here tonight. Who's had a great day so far? Who hasn't and is looking forward to an awesome evening? That's right. That's me. I'm looking forward to an awesome evening. Woohoo! Yes. That's yes. right, as you should, because this is Mickey and she's going to be teaching tonight. Yes! And the crowd goes wild. Yay. That's right. This is not a Stan and Roberta show. That's awesome. Um, I got to pray for a lady um, yesterday. One of my neighbors brought her over, and she just started getting MS symptoms, so numbness, weird sensations up and down her body, and we just kind of prayed with her and uh, commanded it to be gone. Instantly, she was better, and it tried to move to her hand, and we're like, nope. So it left her hand and then kind of just coached her a little bit. And one of the things that, I'm going to go ahead and share the pennies. <laughs> one of the things that we do at our house to visualize the power of God that is in each one of us, a friends of ours from South Africa in November, October, actually beginning of October, um, showed us that you can command, I mean, we're supposed to be doing greater works than God, right? Than Jesus did, right? Yes. We're never going to get there unless we start practicing. You know, baby doesn't run in the Olympics overnight, right? And there's where those are going on right now. And so we just started commanding pennies and coins to stick to the wall by the power of Jesus in us. And guess what? We have a lot of coins on our walls. Some have stayed long enough to defy gravity, so at least three, four seconds, which is impossible in case you haven't done it lately. I'm actually five years old, so I do that a lot. <laughs> but I, we just, I just, the Holy Spirit reminded me of it because there were some right there by our kitchen that while we were talking, and the Holy Spirit directed us toward there. And I just like, this are on the wall because of the power of God in us, and you are no different. And she's like, this is strange. I'm like, it felt strange to us too at first, but we're, if we're going to walk on water, and raise people from the dead, just like Jesus did, we have to start somewhere, and we have to, it helps to visualize it. And so we just commanded ours to stay, our state, and I gave her a penny, and Michael Ann stuck it to the wall in the name of Jesus, and it stayed, it's still there. And she just started crying because she felt, physically felt, up here she felt, realized, this is the power that we have in us. When we lay hands on the sick, it says we sh they shall recover. That was just a visual. Isn't God awesome? Yes. And so this is one of the fun things that happened this week. But And let's see. Um, anyone that stepped out and d uh, did the challenge last week in terms of testimony, sharing their testimonies with someone or... Nope. Yes, Pastor Stan. <laughs> you want to it? <laughs> you want to come up? I'm not the sound guy. Oh, I can do it. So I just, I just wanted to encourage you in this way, okay? Because everybody has a different way they share whenever they are talking to somebody about Christ or about, you know, different things when you walk up to somebody. Um, one of the ways that I share Christ with people that works for me, because it's just the way I do it, uh, it's natural, is I share testimonies of and what my life is walking it out. And so um, there was a lady I haven't seen her in a while at work, a co-worker, and I haven't seen her in a while, and we were talking, and, and she said... Uh, I forgot how it started, but she said something about how's everything going and stuff like that. And I said, oh, we started a church. And she goes, really? Because I hadn't seen her in like six or, six or eight months. And I said, yeah, we started a church. And then I started telling her about the church. And I started telling her about, you know, people getting healed and what we were doing. And then I started telling her about, you know, the mission trips we did. And she just got super excited, you know. So I'm ministering to her, but I'm not ministering at her. I'm just sharing with her what's going on in my life. Mm -hmm. And how easy is it to share that? If you went to a good football game, 
or you went to a good ballet, whatever it is that you like to do. But if you went to some event that you really liked, it's easy to share that event because mm -hmm. you're excited about it. Make sense? Mm -hmm. And it's easy for somebody to listen to it because you're excited about the event you went to. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's the same thing, sharing Christ. It's just being excited about what he's doing in your life and then you're sharing it with somebody else. And so she got like really excited. She goes, I gotta come to your church. So I gave her a card and I said, come if you want to, just go on the website and check it out. You know. And then the guy walked in as I was sharing with with her, and then he got excited. And then he goes, I wanna come. You know, and so then I gave him a card. But it was they got excited because I was excited. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? And so as I was sharing my excitement, they got excited. So that's, a lot of times that's just the way I share and stuff like that. And then if somebody wants to know more, oh, you know, and it usually leads into something more sometimes, but people came in and we got interrupted, so we didn't get to continue. But I'm just saying that from the standpoint of encouraging you um, in your walk and as you're going about your daily life is to get excited and share that excitement with somebody else when that opportunity is there. Because it's easy to share something you're excited about. Does that make sense? Well, thank you, everybody. I uh, really am very grateful for this opportunity. Um, Roberta and Stan asked me to take a session and teach. And little did I know, about two years ago, the Lord came to me in a vision while I was asleep. And I don't know if I was awake or asleep, but this was not part of my presentation, but he wants me to tell you this story. He came to me and I saw him clearly. I knew who he was. And I thought I was awake. I thought I was asleep. But I'm laying in my bed and he stands over me and he puts his hands on my belly and he looked at me and I, I did not know what to say. I was in awe of him. About two months ago, he gave me a dream and a word and he said, Mickey, rivers of living water will flow from your belly. Hmm. And I knew that's what he had done two years ago when he laid hands on my belly. And just because we get a word from the Lord, a message, a vision, a dream, and we don't see something right away or we don't know what it means, hang on, just hang on. Amen. He's going to bring it to life for you. And I believe that tonight is one of those moments for me in my life. So very grateful. And I am grateful for Stan and Roberta because uh, we kind of all grew up together at Karis Bible College, Denver. And um, they're so blessed and so obedient. And this is good ground, people. I'm so excited for what they're doing. And to tithe here is a remarkable blessing, and uh, Roberta mentioned a scripture which I have noted on the handout or the screen, Malachi 3.10.12, when the Lord says, test me, bring, your, bring, bring the food, bring your offering to, the, to my house and store it up here and test me. See that I will open the windows of heaven for you. I'm going to pour down blessings to you until they're not needed anymore. What kind of a promise is that, you know? I mean, we give with a merry heart, a happy heart, a heart of giving, and we know it's laid up in our account in heaven. It really is. Um, so I encourage you, and I thank you, for bringing that up, Roberta, because that was actually part of what I was going to talk about tonight. I had about an hour and a half of material, and now I have to like squish it down, so I'm depending on the Lord here. Uh, I want to talk to you about, first of all, a couple of 
stories that I have because I think your testimonies are very powerful. Some of you have heard my testimonies. Uh, you'll have to sit through this again, I'm afraid. But <laughs> I promise you will be blessed. I had the extreme pleasure to serve the Lord on two missionary trips, one to uh, the Dominican Republic, in 2018, we went with a team from Karis Bible College because we're required to go on a missionary trip to graduate. So in 2018, we went to the Dominican Republic. And let me tell you something. Missionary trips are not a vacation. Hmm. Nope. They are work. But they're so full of rewards. And they're not meant for you to be comfortable. You will not be comfortable, especially if you travel outside of your country. You might not speak a language. The food is strange. The culture is different. The people are often very poor and needy. But one thing I'm going to tell you, they are hungry for truth. And when they see in a foreign country Americans from the United States, the greatest nation in the world, come to pray for them, they look at you in awe. You know why? Because it's hope. You are speaking God's hope into their lives. And it's so crazy. You don't even understand what you're doing. You might not want to go, but go. Because everywhere you step, you are laying ground for the kingdom. Everywhere you go, you claim ground. It's true. It's so true. Um, tonight, like I said, I'm going to share a couple stories. One, one in particular in the Dominican Republic. We had gone to several churches, and one day we were praying for little children and older children and a lot of adults, but we were doing children's ministry. And we had spent maybe 45 minutes playing games with children. and. I was exhausted. I went across the yard to get a drink of water because it was very hot. And a young mother walked towards me with her tiny little girl. She might have been maybe three years old. And uh, she was getting a drink. They speak Spanish there. Now, I do not typically in the natural speak Spanish fluently. I grew up in a home where my parents spoke Spanish, but they did not speak it to us because they wanted us to learn English. Now, I studied probably four years of Spanish, wrote it, read it, tried to speak it. OK, I get out of college. I'm, uh, I'm OK that I don't speak affluent Spanish. But when this woman brought this little girl I don't know, I, don't, I can't explain it, but while I'm telling you these testimonies, I want, to, I want you to search your own life and pick out when the Lord has given you a gift of the Spirit and He used you to give it to somebody else, because that's what it is, that's the power. So, like I say, here comes this beautiful young woman, her tiny little girl. She's getting some water. And I looked at her and I greeted her in Spanish. I can say a few things, sure, anybody can. Buenos dias, como estas? Uh, and I had studied enough to know, can I pray for you in Spanish? She said yes. And this little girl, now consider, I'm sitting down like this because I just needed to rest for a minute. This little tiny girl comes up to me, and her eyes are eh, almost at eye level, and she is staring at me. She's just so amazed, and I'm trying to figure out what, what's going on here. And the, her mother is standing very close by, watching her and I said to her mother, can I pray for her? All this is in Spanish. And I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Well, I start to pray for this little tiny girl. I take her tiny little hands. She is so tiny and sweet. 
and she continues to just lock eyes with me. She is absolutely locked in. She doesn't blink. She's just, and I'm, I'm okay. I'm praying for her. In Spanish, I say to her, the Lord interpreted this for me. Tell her she's a beautiful little girl. I love her very much. And when I started speaking that, he said, I'm smiling at her from heaven. Tell her I'm smiling at her. And so I say all this in Spanish. I'm quite amazed with myself, but <laughs> I'm like, awesome. this little girl starts to do this. And there's no sound coming from her. And the Lord said, she has a spirit of dumbness. She cannot speak. And her mother started to get a little nervous. She moves a little closer to her daughter because I think she wanted to speak for her. So I just start praying in the spirit and I'm holding her hands and she's just glued. Pretty soon, a few seconds later, I called off that spirit of dumbness and commanded her to speak in the spirit. I said that, not with my words. She started to talk. She started bubbling over in Spanish, and her mother started to weep. And so all I want to say is that that was just one, one thing, one, one little kid. You're going to leave a footprint in the earth when you leave here. And I hope it was for the kingdom. That's all I, I, I just need to encourage you in that. So, I also had some pretty amazing experiences when I went to Istanbul, Turkey, and a year later, I went to uh, Istanbul, Turkey with a group, um, uh, some people I knew, some I'd never seen before, but I didn't, I want to tell you, I didn't really want to go, but it was an opportunity of a lifetime, and I'm so glad I was obedient. My friend Gazelle, who is Russian, went to Bible college with us, and she speaks Russian. She was, she was a Muslim in Russia. She grew up Muslim in a Muslim family. When she was born again, her father kicked her out of the family twice. Now she lives in the United States. She's a citizen. She was a Karis Bible College graduate. We've become very close friends. She calls me one day, do you want to go to Istanbul, Turkey? I'm like, sure. And then I told my family, and they were like, oh. I mean, they were so scared, and I started to feel fear. It's dangerous over there. You can't do that. Yes, I can, and I need to go. So that's, that's that. I, I went. And our mission was to hand out Bibles to Iranian Muslims who were visiting in Istanbul, Turkey, uh, for a whole week, that's what we did. We ministered to Iranian Muslims. And <clears throat> here's the tricky thing. It's, it is a crime to proselytize, evangelize, preach the gospel, preach Jesus in that country. You may not do that with Turkish Muslims. That's a crime. You will get in trouble for it, as I found out. But how did we get around that? We are carrying probably 40, 50 Bibles in the backpack every day, probably walked six, maybe seven miles a day on the streets, passing out Bibles, ministering, laying on hands, casting out demons. It was so remarkable. And some of the miracles I saw will always live here in my heart. I will never, ever, ever forget them and the people and their faces. You know there's a cloud of witnesses. <laughs> when you get to heaven, all this sowing you've done, there's going to be people Amen. thanking you. Amen. Thanking you. And they're cheering you all on right now. Yeah. They really are. I um, So we are uh, in Istanbul, Turkey, and we are 
passing out Bibles. And the way we got around that craziness, there's thousands of people there. Many, many people travel from all over the world to Istanbul to do shopping, to uh, enjoy what they have there. It's an amazing and beautiful city. Um, they, the Iranian people go there every year to celebrate their new year. So it was very timely for us to go. Now, we had to basically ask people, are you Iranian? Are you Iranian? And they would either go, yes, or they would go, no. Now, the Turkish people do not like the Iranian people. They like their money, but they do not like those people. So it was fairly easy, but Again, I want you to think about what is the discerning spirits going on here that we had to be in tune with. Discerning of spirits, okay? And really listening to the Holy Spirit because he guides you into all truth. You can't go into outreach, even, it's at, even if it's at Walmart or a farmer's market as I did this morning without listening to him, because for one thing I've learned as I was uh, on mission trips and as I was in, in, in um, Swedish hospital, I worked as a volunteer chaplain there for a while till they started requiring the thing in the arm, uh, which I would not do. My favorite thing is to say, uh, yes, I'm completely, totally vaccinated with the PS91 vaccine. Uh, good for life. So uh, as I was doing all of this work for the Lord at the hospital, I would literally walk by a door of a room and I would stand there for a minute and listen. Is this the, lo is this the one, Lord? And he would say, pass, or he would say, go in. Now, you, you, you really need to pay attention to this, because you don't want to waste your time with people who are going to reject God, because they will mock him, and they will mock you, and that's not what we're here to do. We never argue, we never push, we gently and carefully and lovingly and compassionately compassionately minister to others. So <clears throat> here I am, switching back and forth as the Lord is telling me what to say. In Istanbul, Turkey, it's about our third or fourth day. My guide, his name is Hussein. I'm with Matthew from California and his 11-year-old son and me. There's four of us. We start out our morning handing out New Testament Bibles, which are written in the language of Farsi. Farsi is the Iranians' language. Turkish people do not speak Farsi. They don't know the language. They don't understand it. So, uh, and understand too, there's, there are so many people there. I could look down the street and I could see, I call it a sea of black because they're all wearing their black stuff, you know? What do you call those? Burkas. burkas, black burkas. Now there's a lot of people there who are not wearing burkas, but literally the women are wearing burkas and you could see just a sea of black on the streets just moving. And one thing I did learn too is there's a lot of fear in that culture and um, yet people are hungry for the Lord. They're afraid, though, because this could mean persecution to them. It could literally mean prison. It could mean their life. So we have to be very careful. You know, we're like under the radar. Well, this particular morning, we get out there. We're anxious to go. Every morning, we would go to our room, because it was the biggest room, about 20 people, pray in tongues at least an hour, no less, sometimes two hours before we hit the streets. And one thing I learned too about this, 
outreach or go to a farmer's market or Walmart, wherever. Father, just bring them to me. Bring them to me. Show them to me so that I don't waste my time. He wants all of my heart. He wants all of my, my head, all of my feet, my hands. And I'm not going to waste my time where he doesn't want me to go. So I, I listen. Okay? We walk out in the street. We're carrying our Bibles. And uh, we get to the corner. And our guide, Hussein, pulls the Bible out of his pocket, hands it to a man who approached him. And in Istanbul, during that week, you've got to see this in your mind, there are police, heavily armed police everywhere. There are military tanks situated here and there. And there's a lot of secret police. They had been watching us. And uh, I can tell you a few stories about that, but he handed a Bible to a, one of the secret police. Here come three or four guys, and they say, come with us, we're going down to the police station. And I'm like, oh, okay, here we go. And uh, start praying in tongues real, real fast. Uh, Lord, get us out of this. And we walked about, I don't know, three blocks and winding stairs. Everything there is very old. You have marble and stone all over the place. And they walk us into the police station. And we're walking up these winding stairs and I start to feel, here we are, a spirit of the, the discerning of spirits so heavy, so dark. I can't even hardly walk up these stairs and Hussein took my backpack. I think I'm going to vomit because of the spirits that were in that place were so dark and such an antichrist spirit. We get to the top. I sit on a bench and there's a window there and the sun is coming through and I just know it's the Lord shining his light, shining his light. Well, these two big burly guys come in. They, we have to throw our backpacks on the floor. They go through our backpacks. They took my phone. They interrogated us. I will use that word because it felt like it. They ask us, where are you from? What are you doing here? Where have you been? Why are you here? Who are these people? Are you married to him? Blah, blah, blah. I mean, this went on and on. And... I'm thinking, they took my phone. Well, and all of my information is there, my visa, my passport. And then one came back and he told our guide who speaks Turkish, he told him in Turkish, we're going to call the US Embassy. So I said, OK. Still praying in tongues, all of us praying in tongues. And one of these guys, who was particularly kind of like a bully, he reaches down, pulls the Bible out, opens it. He opens the Bible, and he points his finger out a scripture. He hands the Bible to Hussein. He says, what does this say in Turkish? Hussein reads it and tells him in Turkish, what does that scripture say? It was about Jesus. So he starts Okay, he takes the Bible, he throws it back in the backpack. So he's going to bully us a little bit more. Pretty soon he reaches down, takes the Bible out again, finds a scripture, hands it to Hussein. What does this say? Hussein is now preaching the gospel to three big burly Turkish police officers. And I'm just like, thank you, Jesus. Yeah, here we go. Well, a third time he did this. Three times he did it. He pulls the Bible out. This time he's a little more gentle with it. He finds a scripture. He asks a question about who is Jesus. Tell me about your Jesus. Hmm. Tell me about your Jesus. 
So, Hussein, being a, an Iranian refugee, they could have taken him and sent him right back to Iran. They could have, and that was scary to him. He, he was uncomfortable, but I have to say, you know what? There's a man of God. He's going to preach to a Muslim who could literally control the rest of his life. And about that time, the, they come, the other guys come back in, give me back my phone, said something to Hossein. Hossein looks at me and says, we're going to go. We get to go. And so we, we left, but not before we asked these police officers, can we pray for you? Hmm. And they looked around, not here, we'll go outside. So we went down to the courtyard, went out of the building. They each took a Bible, and the one who was being kind of bully with us, he says, maybe I'll become a Christian. Wow. And so I want you to understand that it doesn't matter really where you go. You're representing the kingdom. You have the power in you. And I was walking with uh, Guzel and a couple of other of our friends there up a sidewalk one day. And there was a little commotion going on. And Guzel's grabbing my arm and she says, come, come here, come here, come and pray for this man. He was laying on the sidewalk having a seizure. And <clears throat> I hear the Lord say, it's a spirit of infirmity. His eyes were rolled back. He couldn't talk. He's like, ah, you know, I mean, it was, this was a demon. And his two friends who were with them were, uh, they were freaking out. They're like, we don't know what happened. They were Iranian. They did speak English. I laid my hands on him. The Lord said, it's a, it's a spirit of infirmity. I told that thing to get out of that man. And it didn't take but a few seconds. When God has a vessel, and you're willing, and you obey, it's done. It's done. And uh, his eyes straightened out. His friends helped him to his feet. He did not know what happened to him. He didn't know. There was no sickness that they were aware of. There was no um, reason that they could even explain that this happened. But they told us, we are Christian. We handed them a Bible and they were grateful, almost in tears. To have God's word in writing, this is a treasure. And I think sometimes we take this for granted. I, I, um, when you're in this country and you're trying to minister, people will put their hand up and say, no, I'm good. I'm good. I don't, I don't need prayer. I don't need any of that. But you're like in a wheelchair. <laughs> okay. Uh, I just want to say that, you know, find yourself, find yourself in this book of life. You are in here. You're in here. And your story is written, and your story's been written in heaven. It is, Evan. Your story is alive. I see it all over you. God bless this young man, a mighty, mighty man of God he will be. I see his heart right now, and it's almost bringing tears to my eyes. You know, such a blessing. You are such a blessing to the kingdom, Evan. There are people in this room who the Lord has specifically chosen. This man right here, he walks in so much authority. Authority. When he talks, people stop to listen. That's a gift. So let's talk a little bit 
I gave you a few scriptures, and I want to talk a little bit about Genesis. When Abraham was going to sacrifice his only son, he was obedient. Genesis 22, 15 and 8 through 18. And the Lord speaks to him. He says, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your, your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as stars of the heaven and as sand on the seashore. Seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Abraham did not withhold anything from God. Absolutely nothing. He was obedient. Why? Because he already knew the promise God had given him. But this scripture particularly touched my heart when I was studying one day. Your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. So I looked up the gate. I looked up gate in the Hebrew, and it basically says the entrance to a city where people would have to pass through, and it controlled marketing and judging. Think about that for today. What's going on in our nation? What's going on in our country? The world. Look at this promise. Your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. Wow. Isn't that powerful? It's so good. God is so good. I'm going to take you to the end of this book. You've read this book, you've read some things, you find yourself in it, you discover where the Lord has given you a revelation of the gift that he has given you. And not only are you to have that gift, but you're going to hang on to it. You're going to hold it. You're going to possess that gift because he gave it to you. And he wants you to use it for the kingdom. Uh, Revelation 3.11, I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Look at Roberta and Stan. What's a more perfect example? What do you have that you have to hold on to? Possess it. Hold fast. Can you think of what you've been given from the Lord? And it's going to take you to the end of the book. And at the end of your life here, the Lord says, What did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with it? And I pray to God we have answers. And then he gives you a crown. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I got the goosebumps too. So it's, it's all good. So I want you to think about what is your calling? What are the gifts you have already discovered that you have? The gifts that are coming? Um, how have you used them? Hold on to them? Build on them? And don't let anybody else, including the devil, take what belongs to you. Amen? Amen. Praise God. I think that this was the most, uh, John 16, 13 through 15 is probably the most important scripture to me when going out on out outreach or a mission trip. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he speaks, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Another promise. Isn't that amazing? Yes. He's going to declare to you 
what the Lord has given you. He will tell you the truth. He will guide you. You have to listen and obey. He leads you to all truth. And that, and that, and that truth is what brings the fruit. It brings you fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, right? You'll see the harvest come in, like Roberta was talking about. Um, <clears throat> he will speak to you of things to come. Ah, things to come. Yes. That could be in two minutes. It could be ten years. Who knows? But it's there, another thing to hold on to. If somebody gives you a word of prophecy, they prophesy over you, hang on to it. Hang on to it. It's a treasure, especially if you know that someone who spoke that over you has integrity, has, has been living a uh, godly life. So that brings us to some foundational things that we should all be doing and thank you Roberta for talking about tithing and offerings because that is a basic foundation of Christian living fast, fast pray fast and give giving is uh, tithing as we talked about giving can be your time your energy helping other people that's all giving and giving with a happy heart so I think I'm going to try to finish this part up and we're going to do an exercise. I have a couple more scriptures to read. Um, I do want to call your attention to Romans 8:35 through 37. And I always, in this anyway, in this lesson, I read from the English Standard Version, the ESV. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in these things, we are, no, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. What's the point here that Paul was saying? We are privileged to be here today carrying on the Great Commission for the Kingdom because of what these guys did. They suffered, they were persecuted, they were murdered. So I don't take that lightly. I take communion almost every day. I repent of my sins. It's not like I'm out there and doing really bad things because I'm not. But but a sin can be something he asked you to do that you, eh, I was tired yesterday, so like I didn't do it. So I'll repent of that, and I'll be better. I promise, Lord, I'll be better tomorrow. I'll be better today. And, and so repentance and communion, and when I take communion, I say, Lord, my life was bought with a price, and I thank you for it. Amen. He paid that price for all sin, for all time, for all people, which is pretty amazing. Um, and the last scripture I want to go over is Hebrews 10, 12 through 13. When Christ had offered for all time single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. Who's going to make that footstool for our Lord? Who's going to do that? Who's going to bring down those enemies? Who's going to bring down those demons, the devil? Who's going to bring them down in our world? Who? We have a hand over here and a hand over here. Yes, 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 yes. You especially, yes, all of you. It's us. We are the hands and the feet of God. And I'm going to leave you with one more thing. 
because when I go out on an outreach, and I usually go by myself, um, wherever I am, today it was the farmer's market at Southlands Shopping Mall. And there's a young lady in a wheelchair, and the Lord, do it, yes sir, I am on it. It doesn't matter where you're at, but as I started praying for this young lady, she couldn't talk. She had some kind of brain damage as well as her body was not working. Pretty soon, and her mother gave me permission to lay hands on her, and I said, do you know Jesus? Her name was Paige. And she looked at me, and do you know this little lady's, her, this young lady, probably she was maybe 16, her eyes lit up, and immediately I knew, I knew that she loved Jesus. I laid my hands on her, and I am going to town praying for her. Her mother is agreeing, and pretty soon there's like six people, eight people, ten people just, they want to see what God is going to do. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit, he never lets us down. And I didn't see her get out of that wheelchair this morning, but she will. She will. Um, regarding the Holy, the Holy Trinity, I think it's important for, for us to understand when we're out ministering, because there's a lot of people who have questions about that. And especially, uh, you never know if they're believers or not. But I started ministering to some Jehovah's Witnesses one day, and I did bring one of them to the Lord. But they don't understand the Trinity. They deny it. They do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So let me give you just a really simple way to explain the Trinity to people who don't get it. And this was, this was so good. Jesse Duplantis said this not too long ago, and I, I took it from him, and I use it now. Simply put, the heart of God is the Father. The face of God is Jesus, and the voice of God is the Holy Spirit. Three beings, one God. He does it all. And who are the hands and feet of God? Us. Us, exactly. So be blessed. I, um, I so much appreciate this opportunity. I hope you are blessed with this. I would like to move into answering the questions, getting in groups. Roberta's going to help put us in groups. And here's the questions. Uh, where are the questions, sir? Okay. Practice time. So, where do you see yourself right now with the Holy Spirit and how can you step forward into your calling? Something you need to think about. Answer these questions in your group if you can. What are the giants that must be taken down that get in your way? Why am I afraid to approach somebody to pray for them? What keeps me from doing that? Search your heart. I'm going to pray that the Lord is going to search your hearts tonight. He's going to reveal to you how are you limiting God in your life? How are you limiting yourself? Because you have the power. He gave it to you. In those two scriptures I gave you, Jesus gives us the great commission, the command. And the last one, if you can identify the spiritual gifts you have already operated in, how can you build on them? The gifts of the Spirit written there for you. And in this group, please pray for each other and encourage each other 
in operating in the gifts is critical to your success and increasing the kingdom. Thank you very much. Right. <laughs> Who was blessed here? Amen. All right.